Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship on this last Sunday of March. And I want to say our second Sunday of spring. We have some celebrations to announce this week. Uh, anniversaries for Helen and Hubert Hall on March 28th and Marilyn Lonas and Richard Laren on March 31st. We also have birthday greetings going out to Becky Babin and Rosalie Higby, who both have birthdays on the 31st. And Georgia McKinnon, I discover, has a birthday this week. So happy birthday, all. I'm going to try that song, I think. Congratulations to you, to Jesus be true. May God's richest blessings abide with you. Uh, this week in the United Church of Canada Prayer Circle, we're asking you to keep in your prayers the Cumberland Pastoral Charge, as well the World Council of Churches is asking us to keep the Czech Republic, Poland, and Slovakia in our prayers. This coming week, uh, we finish up the Lenten Bible study called The Common People Heard Him Gladly. And this week, the uh, Easter story will be explored through the story of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Everyone is invited to join in the Easter or in the Wednesday Bible study, either in person uh, in the church parlor at 10 or uh, on Zoom. And invitations will be sent out this week. Uh, Monday Thursday is coming up this week as well, and there will be a Monday Thursday service at 7 p.m., and it will focus on the last time Jesus gathered with his disciples to share a meal. Uh, this service will be a Zoom service only, and again, connection information will be sent out to all who uh, are interested in participating. On Friday, Good Friday, we'll be holding a Good Friday service here at Beacon at 11 in the morning. And that one also will be available through Zoom. And again, people can watch their emails for connection information. Because of COVID restrictions, for the first time in a long time, we won't be having our uh, sunrise service or Holy Saturday meditations. But there will be a service here uh, next Sunday, April 4th at 11, as we celebrate the resurrection with our Easter morning worship service. Uh, notice about a community event here, a couple of community events. Um, the Yarmouth Hospice Society invites you to a fundraising drive through supper coming up on Saturday, April 17th. It'll take place at the Lions Club on Parade Street from 4 to 6 p.m. And the meal will be Russian chicken, vegetables, and dessert. You're asked if you're going to take part to get tickets in advance, and those can be pick it, picked up at City Drugstore, or you can... Uh, call Cheryl Hurlbert or Shirley Hubbard to reserve a ticket. And if you want their phone numbers, you can check with me. Um, also coming up this week on Wednesday, March 31st, in recognition of the International Transgender Day of Visibility, there will be ceremonies held at 10 a.m. at the town hall with a flag raising. COVID protocols will be followed. And then tonight, for all of those who are council members, remind you that there is a church council meeting tonight via Zoom at 7 p.m. And those are all of the announcements I have for this week. Becky. Yes, it will be in the church. Yes. It'll be both. So the Good Friday service will be right here Friday morning. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Yep. Thanks, Becky, for confirming that. Any other announcements that I missed? Then with that, I invite you to greet your neighbor with a wave and the peace of Christ. <clears throat> As we gather this morning, let us remember that the land on which we gather is by law the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq people. 
We gratefully acknowledge this, and we respectfully honor their traditions and their spirituality, along with the traditions and spirituality of all our First Nations brothers and sisters. And now as we begin our worship, let's take a moment of silence to center ourselves as we enter this sacred time. During the season of Advent, we light candles as we prepare to receive the light of Christ at Christmas. During Lent, we extinguish candles as we prepare for the day that that light was snuffed out. Today, we come to our last Lenten candle. It is the Palm Passion Candle. We remember the joyous shouts of Hosanna and the steps of our Lenten journey begin to dance as we willingly join the crowd. It's like a great parade and we want to celebrate with great joy. But barely have the shouts of joy and praise faded away when we hear another shout, Crucify him! Our faltering steps begin to hesitate. We want to run away, but we can't. We don't want to be part of this crowd, but we are. This too is part of our Lenten journey. If we are to see this journey through to the end, we must walk through both the Hosanna and the Crucify Him. Let us join in our call to worship. Today is a day of great joy and celebration. Today is a day of great pain and sorrow. Today is a day we remember how Jesus was welcomed like a conquering hero. Today is the day we remember that Jesus was betrayed and arrested like a common criminal. Today is a day of extremes, of joy and of sorrow, of celebration and of anger, of praise and of condemnation. Today is a day we remember that in all the joy and sorrow, in all our pain and excitement, we are not alone. We follow in the footsteps of the one who points us to God. And so this day, we worship together. Let us pray. Today, O oh God, we stand between joy and sorrow. With joy, we shout Hosanna and welcome Jesus. Yet even in the shouts of Hosanna, we sense the tension 
the fear and the anger of those whom Jesus challenges. We realize how quickly the shouts of Hosanna can turn to cries of crucify him. We stand between joy and sorrow, O oh God, because we know how easy it is to be swayed by the crowd. We stand between joy and sorrow, O oh God, because we know how easy it is to sit back and watch from a safe distance rather than getting involved. We yearn for the joy to last forever. We yearn to way to avoid the sorrow. O oh God, as we stand between joy and sorrow, we yearn for the assurance that no matter what, you are with us. Amen. The scripture readings for this morning are divided into two distinctive parts, the litany of the palms and the litany of the passion. Normally, we divide the two into two separate sections and talk about them separately. But this morning, we're going to hear the whole story at one time. 
because of the amount of reading recommended by the lectionary. This morning we are going to hear only the gospel readings for today. We begin with the story of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem when Jesus arrived to shouts of Hosanna. Mark 11, 1 to 11. <clears throat> As they approached Jerusalem near the towns of Bethpage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with those instructions. Go to the village where they are ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, say that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street tied to the door of a house. And they went, were untying it. Some of the bystanders asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them and the crowd let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the field and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our Father, praise be to God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. And since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. We continue this story a week later. The disciples have gathered together to share a Passover meal. Judas has already arranged to betray Jesus. And during the meal, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. But now we pick up the story as Jesus and his disciples leave that upper room where they have shared their meal and head across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, to a garden there known as Gethsemane. They came to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He told Peter, James, and John with him. Distress and anguish came over him, and he said to them, The sorrow in my heart is so great that it almost crushes me. Stay here and keep watch. He went a little further on, threw himself on the ground, and prayed that if possible he might not have to go through this time of suffering. Father, he prayed, my father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup of suffering away from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he returned and found the three disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Aren't you able to stay awake for even one hour? And he said to them, Keep watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away once more and prayed, saying the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and found them asleep. They could not keep their eyes open, and they did not know what to say to him. When he came back the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting enough? The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is now being handed over to the power of sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, here is a man who is betraying me. 
Jesus was still speaking when Jesus, one of the twelve disciples, arrived. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs and sent by the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. The traitor had given the crowd a signal. The man I kiss is the one you want. Arrest him and take him away under guard. As soon as Jesus, as soon as Judas arrived, he went up to Jesus and said, Teacher, and kissed him. So they arrested Jesus and held him tight. Then Jesus was taken to the high priest's house where all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law were gathering. Peter followed from a distance and went into the courtyard of the high priest's house. Then he sat down with the guards, keeping himself warm by the fire. The chief priests and the whole council tried to find some evidence against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they could not find any. Many witnesses told lies about against Jesus, but their stories did not agree. Peter was still down in the courtyard when one of the high priest's servant women came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked straight at him and said, You too were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it. I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about, he answered, and went out into the passageway. Just then, a rooster crowed. The servant woman saw him there and began to repeat to the bystanders, He is one of them but Peter denied it again. A little while later, bystanders accused Peter again. You can't deny that you are one of them because you too are from Jerusalem, Galilee. Then Peter said, I swear that I am telling the truth. May God punish me if I am not. I do not know the man you are talking about. Just then a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows two times, you will say three times that you do not know me. And he broke down and cried. Early in the morning, the chief priests met hurriedly with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole council, and made their plans. They put Jesus in chains, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, So you say. The chief priests were accusing Jesus of many things. So Pilate questioned him again, Aren't you going to answer? Listen to all their accusations. Again, Jesus refused to say a word, and Pilate was amazed. At every Passover festival, Pilate was in the habit of setting free one prisoner the people asked for. At that time, a man named Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed a num murder in the riot. When the crowd gathered and began to ask Pilate for the usual favor, he asked them, Do you want me to set free for you the king of the Jews? He knew very well that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him because they were jealous. But the chief priests stirred up by the crowd to ask instead that Pilate set Barabbas free for them. Pilate said again to the crowd, What then do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. But what crime has he committed? Pilate asked. They shouted all the louder, Crucify him. Pilate wanted to please the crowd, so he set Barabbas free for them. Then he had Jesus whipped and handed over to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus inside to the courtyard of the governor's palace and called together the rest of the company. They put a purple robe on Jesus, made a crown out of thorny branches, and put it on his head. Then they began to salute him. 
Long live the king of the Jews. They beat him over the head with a stick, spat on him, fell on their knees and bowed down to him. When they had finished making fun of him, they took off the Pope of old and put his own clothes back on him. Then they let him off to crucify him. On the way, they met a man named Simon, who was coming into the city from the country, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They took Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they tried to give him wine mixed with a drug called myrrh, but Jesus would not drink it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes among themselves, throwing dice to see who would get which piece of clothing. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the accusation against him said, the king of the Jews. They also crucified two bandits with Jesus, one on his right and the other on the left. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness which lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Some of the people there heard him and said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. One of them ran up with a sponge and soaked it in cheap wine and put it on the end of a stick. Then he held it up to Jesus' lips and said, wait, let us see if Elijah is coming to bring him down from the cross. With a loud cry, Jesus died. The curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The army officer who had, was standing there in front of the cross saw how Jesus had died. This man was really the son of God, he said. I want you to try and imagine yourself being part of that crowd that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem so long ago. Chances are that the reason you're there is because you're on your way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. You may have traveled some distance to get there. And you're feeling is that of a great festival or celebration. You may do this every year, or this may be a once-in-a-lifetime trip. But regardless, there is an excitement and a festive feel in the air. As you walk along the road to Jerusalem, word begins to spread that Jesus of Nazareth is coming. You've likely heard about him. You may even have been there in one of those crowds that gathered to hear him speak. You've likely heard the stories of him curing lepers, giving sight to the blind, making the lame walk. He's certainly causing quite a stir. The temple authorities don't think much of him because he's telling the people that Yahweh loves them so much that if they aren't able to keep all the laws the Pharisees tell them to, it's okay. Plus, those he's cured of leprosy seem to feel obliged to make the required sacrifices at the temple. It's really messing up their control of things. The crowd begins to part. He's coming up behind you. You step to one side, along with everyone else. 
The dust on the road is so thick because of all the people that have been heading to Jerusalem. Someone near you grabs a cloak and tries to cover the dust on the road. Others follow, and then some start cutting branches and laying them across the path to keep the dust down so that people can see. Then you see him. He's riding on a donkey, surrounded by his disciples. It's just like the prophet Zechariah had promised. The future king would come riding into Jerusalem victorious, but riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace and humility. Is it possible that Jesus is that future king promised long ago? Is he the one that will triumph over Rome? Is he the long-awaited Messiah? The excitement reaches a fever pitch as Jesus passes by. Many from the crowd fall in behind him, shouting, Hosanna! and praising God. Perhaps this was it. Perhaps he's headed to Jerusalem to take over. You fall in with the crowd, waiting, watching, expecting. Surely it's about, you're about to witness something amazing, something historic. You can hardly wait to see what's going to happen next. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with his disciples. What? He simply left? But he was supposed to overthrow Rome. Even if he wasn't going to do that right now, surely he should have at least addressed the crowd. So many people had gathered. So many people were shouting his praises. So many people were watching, waiting, hoping. Hoping for a miracle. Hoping for healing. Hoping for freedom hoping for something, anything. And he just turned and walked away? How disappointing. Perhaps he wasn't all that he was made out to be. Perhaps the stories were just that, stories. Perhaps he wasn't all you'd heard all you'd hoped for. Perhaps you'd gotten your hopes up for nothing. How disappointing. There'd been no military coup under the leadership of Jesus. There'd been no miracles, no healing, no forgiveness of sin, no redistribution of wealth, no freedom for the slaves. There hadn't even been one of his famous speeches. It seemed he hadn't even acknowledged the adoration of the crowd. He simply rode into town, checked out the temple, and then left. Imagine how you might have felt. He'd accepted your praise and adoration yet barely even acknowledged you. You were so excited and hopeful, waiting to see what he would do next. But he did nothing. He built up your hopes, only to let you down. How do you feel? Disappointed? Disillusioned? perhaps even a little bit embarrassed 
for having been taken in by such an obvious charlatan. If you had actually been there that day, can you honestly say that you would not have experienced at least some of these feelings, even if you didn't want to? We all know that it's a very short leap from disappointment and disillusionment to anger. How dare anyone get your hopes up like that and then dash them into the ground? How dare anyone accept your praise and adoration and then do nothing? How could they not be what you hoped for, what you expected? Anger. Disappointment, disillusionment, embarrassment, a sense of betrayal. All these emotions are very human reactions. And much as we would like to think, we would never feel that way. How sure are we that these thoughts might not at least subconsciously, begin to creep in. But life goes on. The preparations for the Passover continue, and the atmosphere of celebration is more. No more is heard about Jesus until the morning after the Passover meal has been shared. At this point, you do not know that he has shared the Passover meal with his disciples. You do not know that one of his inner circle has betrayed him to the temple of police. You do not know that he has been arrested under the dark of night to ensure his followers don't cause problems. And you do not know that he has been deserted by all of those closest to him. What you do know is that it's time for Pilate to release one prisoner as part of the Passover celebrations. So you join the crowd waiting to see who will be released. That's when you see him again. He certainly looks a lot different than he did a week ago. It's obvious that he has been beaten. You might even start feeling sorry for him. After all, what has he really done that was so bad? He might have claimed to be something he was not, but was he really any worse than all those others who claimed to be the Messiah? Then you start to hear the whispers among the crowd. Did you know he threatened to tear down the temple? Can you imagine Jerusalem without the temple? There would be no more Passover. There would be no more sacrifice. No more way of obtaining forgiveness for sin. Yahweh would desert the people. Things might be bad right now, but can you imagine how bad they would be if Yahweh deserted us? And without the temple authorities to speak up for the people to the Romans, who knows what would happen? If this Jesus continues to stir up unrest, the Romans could decide to arbitrarily execute anyone they suspected of being one of his followers. They'd done it before. You were part of the crowd that was cheering him when he arrived in Jerusalem. What if someone had seen you and reported you to the Romans, 
reported that you were one of his followers. You might be one of those ones chosen to be executed simply because you were there. There would be no trial. You wouldn't stand a chance. Perhaps this Jesus is a lot more dangerous than you initially thought. Then you hear someone shout, Release Barabbas! Crucify Jesus! Others begin to take up the cry. More and more people are shouting for Jesus to be crucified. They must really be concerned. They must really think he is dangerous. Maybe they know something you don't. Maybe they're right. At the time, you didn't know that the temple authorities were there working the crowd. You didn't know that they were the ones who thought Jesus was so dangerous. You didn't know they were worried for their own security if too many people started taking Jesus seriously. All you know is that everyone seems to be demanding his crucifixion. You don't dare go against them, right? Now, what might happen? Maybe you join in the shouts of the crowd. Or maybe you just remain silent. But the results are the same. Jesus is handed over. He is whipped, beaten, mocked, and finally led away to Golgotha, the place of the skull, the hill of execution. The crowd follows. You may not have intended to go with them, but somehow you're drawn along. You find yourself there, watching. They try to drug him like they do all the prisoners, but he refuses. They strip off his clothes and the soldiers cast lots for them. They always do that. It's considered to be part of their pay. There are two others crucified with him. Suddenly the sky starts to turn black. There doesn't seem to be any rain or wind. It's so strange. You have to strain to see him now. Then you hear him cry out, God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Some people laugh. Some just shake their heads. Someone tries to offer him some cheap wine to help dull the pain. But he lets out one last cry. And then, then there is silence. There are no shouts of triumph as he dies. Even the laughter seems to die away. It's so quiet. It's as if the whole world seems to stand still. Then you hear it. A single voice. The soldier standing at the foot of the cross, even though it's little more than a whisper, in the silence, it rings through loud and clear. This man really was the Son of God.
this man really was the son of God. What have you done? What have you done? We believe that God has called and used to call each one of us. One of the ways in which we answer the call is through the gifts that we offer back to God. Those gifts may be the offering that we place on the offering plates. They may be the offerings we make through PAR, through online donations. Or they may be donations we make outside of the walls of this church. They may also be the offerings of our time, our abilities, and our commitment. But whatever it is that we offer to God this day, let us ask God's blessing upon it. Let us pray. Loving God, bless the gifts that we offer today, whatever these gifts may be. Bless them and use them, we pray. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silence as we offer our own personal prayers for those named in our prayer jar and for all those who are on our hearts and our minds this day. Amen.
building a world where everyone belongs. Everyone belongs. That belief anchors our United Church. It's why our mission and service gifts support gatherings of people who are left on the margins of society and support education events that help us learn what we can do about it. Disability is one aspect of social justice the United Church is working on. Did you know that one in five Canadians live with at least one disability? That's 6.2 million people. Of these, 1.2 million can't afford AIDS, devices, or prescription medications. People living with severe disabilities have half the income of those with none. Seniors are almost twice as likely to have a disability as people who are of working age. Disability is an, is, is an issue that affects us all. That's why the United Church partners with people from other denominations to raise awareness. People like Anglican disability activist, Linda Kitsuno, who is widely considered a pioneer in the field. Linda has lived with this accident in 1973. At the time, she was a primary school teacher and loved her job working with children. After the accident, she wasn't sure if she would be able to return to what she loved because the school wasn't accessible. Linda accredits a committed principal and board of education superintendent for making the changes that would enable her to return to her job. I became a disability activist when I realized that it takes political will to change society for the better. Our community is made stronger when we include people with disabilities. If people had, with disabilities were fully welcome, the world would be a better place. It would be a place where there is hope and no fear, she says. Ideas of mutuality, inclusiveness, and justice drive Linda's passion to make the world a better place for all. I don't want to be seen as a poor, pathetic person. I want to be seen as a child of God. Your generosity supports events and education that help create healthy, strong, well-thinking, welcoming committees, communities inside and outside the church. Communities where no one is left out, where we are all valued as children of God. Let's build a world where everyone belongs. Make your mission and service gift for belonging today. Let us join in prayer. As we gather together on this Palm Passion Sunday, we come to the cross. We look up. We see the broken Christ. And we pray for our broken world. We pray for refugees who've had to flee their homes and communities because of violence, terrorism, and war. We pray for boys forced to fight and girls forced into prostitution. We pray for those hated by their neighbors or bullied by peers or authorities. We pray for the broken in our broken world, and God calls us to reflect and to act. We come to the cross. We look up. We see the suffering Christ. 
and we pray for those suffering within our own community. We pray for the homeless. We pray for the abused, women, children, intimate partners, the elderly. We pray for those we know who are sick, family members, friends, members of our faith community. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who have had to put dreams and hopes on hold, especially during this time of pandemic. We pray for all who suffer and God calls us to reflect and to act. We come to the cross. We look up. We see the abandoned Christ. And we pray for all who are alone and isolated and who feel abandoned. We pray for those isolated by COVID-19. We pray, pray for the unemployed. We pray for those living far away from family and friends. We pray for those who are isolated by fear or anger. We pray for those feeling unwanted and unloved. We pray for those whose friends have let them down. We pray for ourselves when we have let others down. We pray for all who feel abandoned in our world and God calls us to reflect and to act. We come to the cross, we look up, we see Christ looking down at us. In him we see reflected our own brokenness. In him we see reflected our own suffering. In him we see reflected our own fear and isolation. And as we stand looking up at the cross, we reach out to you, O oh God, in faith and in trust. Amen.
In a world that seeks to avoid suffering, we call the suffering servant all the way to the cross. But as we go out from this place of worship, we go knowing the journey does not end here. We know that nothing, not life, not death, not anything the world can throw at us, can ever separate us from God's divine love. And so we go, knowing we do not go alone. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Oh. 